We are honored to be here at the Conference Center at the Rio Salado College for this important event, and I want to thank them for, host, for hosting today's State of the District Address. I'm pleased to have the chance to introduce Dr. Chris Bustamante, the president of Rio Salado College and Maricopa Corporate College. Both colleges are located here in Tempe and are part of the Maricopa County Community College District. Rio Salado College is the largest institution in that district and serves nearly 55,000 students every year. The Corporate College, and if you're not familiar with it, this is a lot, they can do a lot with the folks here in the room because they do customized workforce and training solutions for business and industry. Dr. Bustamante was appointed president of Rio Salado College in June 2010 and president of the Maricopa Corporate College in August 2016. His prior leadership roles at Rio Salado include vice president of community development and student services and dean of academic affairs. He previously served in senior level government as assistant to the superintendent for community and government relations for the Phoenix Union High School District and as a legislative aide in the Arizona House of Representatives. A native to Arizona, he holds both a doctorate and master's degree in educational leadership from Northern Arizona University. Dr. Bustamani is a City of Tempe resident, well known as an advocate for increasing access to higher education and degree completion, and for forging transformational partnerships with business, government, and educational providers. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Bustamante. Thank you, Anne, very much for that uh, warm introduction. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to Rio Salado College. Uh, many of you have been here before. Uh, some of you have not. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about us and how we serve our community. I want to extend a special thank you to Anne and the Tempe Chamber for the partnership that we have had in holding this event um, at this location annually for the last few years and for many other partnership initiatives that uh, we have engaged together in. Especially want to welcome Congresswoman Cinema. Um, she's a former community college student, and I know proud to be so, and has provided a State of the District update here at the college for a few years now. And we thank her for her work on behalf of Tempe residents, our students, and our business community. She's always been a great supporter and friend of the Maricopa Community Colleges and Rio Salado College. So I know she appreciates our mission to serve students in our various communities, in particular, uh, including veterans uh, and how we serve them. So thank you, Congresswoman Cinema, for your continued support and advocacy. We appreciate it very much. The Maricopa Community College District educates over 200,000 students a year, each year in 10 colleges located throughout Maricopa County and is the largest provider of workforce uh, training in Arizona and is one of the largest community college systems <clears throat> in the nation. Rio Salado College, as you know, is headquartered here in Tempe, as was stated, and we're proud uh, to serve as Tempe's uh, community college. We serve nearly, as was stated, uh, 53,000 students each year as a single college, um, and that makes us the largest of the, of the 10 colleges. The Tempe Union High School District is our largest dual enrollment uh, or early college partner with students in five high schools that we serve there. In fact, Dr. Kenneth Baca, who is the superintendent of the Tempe Union High School District, is here with us this morning. It's great to have you with us, Dr. Baca. Through our partnership, we served more than 2,500 students last year who earned more than 25,500 college credits that are transferable to uh, Arizona's universities and over 100 institutions nationally. Uh, we think that's a great accomplishment, not only for our institutions, but for our students and their families. This year, we're expecting over 160 high school dual enrollment students to earn their associate's degrees before graduating from high school. Uh, most of these students coming from the Tempe Union High School District. So we're doing really important work here in Tempe. <clears throat> we are, are also providing college opportunity through our workforce program partnerships with Tempe businesses, companies like American Airlines, SRP, GoDaddy, Macy's Credit and Customer Services Center, State Farm, and others. In addition, we provide, as it was stated, non-credit training to local businesses through the Maricopa Corporate College, which our college leads and directs on behalf of the Maricopa Community College District. We also operate our online program at scale, serving nearly 28,000 students annually, not only from Arizona, but throughout the nation. Uh, one thing that distinguishes us from others is we offer 40 start dates um, starting almost every Monday of the year, which uh, distinguishes us from most institutions 
uh, distance learning institutions. Also, KJZZ, the NPR affiliate news and jazz station, and KBAQ, the classical radio station, both serving Tempe and the Phoenix metro region operate out of the adjacent Rio Tower to this building and are licensed by the Maricopa Community College District, um, if you didn't know that. Uh, we share the KBOC license with Arizona State University. So as you can see, we're very busy serving our various communities with needed educational programming in a, in a variety of ways. At this time, I'd like to thank my colleagues from Rio Salado College, uh, Mesa Community College, I know we have a representative from there, representing the President's Office and the Maricopa District Office. We also have some President's Advisory Council members from, from Rio here as well. Um, in particular, I'd like to recognize Dr. Carla Fisher, our Provost, Darcy Renfro, our Chief of Staff from our Chancellor's Office, and Diana Villanueva Salcedo, our Director of Community Engagement. So if you could give them a hand for me, that would be great. I appreciate them being here, um, and especially for the district's co-sponsorship of this event annually. We appreciate it very much. So thanks for allowing me the opportunity to welcome you and to let you know a little bit more about how we serve our Tempe community um, and uh, other communities. So I know that we're all looking very much forward uh, to hearing from Congresswoman Cinema. So at this time, please join me in welcoming and go back to the podium to continue with the program. So have a great Easter weekend. Thank you so much, Dr. Bustamante. We're honored to partner with you and appreciate that. Our honor guest this morning is Congresswoman Kirsten Sinema, the U.S. Representative for Arizona's 9th Congressional District. A member of the Democratic Party, she has served in both chambers of the Arizona Legislature, being elected to the Arizona House of Representatives in 2005 and the Arizona Senate in 2011, and has served in Congress since 2013. Sinema was born in Tucson, Arizona, she graduated at high school valedictorian at age 16, which is phenomenal, and went on to earn her Bachelor's of Arts from Brigham Young University in 1995 at the age of 18. She received her Master of Social Work from Arizona State University in 1999. In 2004, she earned her Juris, um, Juris Doctorate pardon me, from Arizona State University College of Law. In 2012, she earned a PhD in Justice Studies also from Arizona State. She was a social worker from 1995 to 2002 in the Washington Elementary School District before becoming an attorney in 2005. She has also been an adjunct instructor at the Arizona State University School of Social Work since 2003. As our representative in the United States Congress, she has worked to create jobs and grow our local economy and was awarded the Spirit of Enterprise Award from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, and we will award her for 2018 today. So thank you so much that you do for business. She has helped several Tempe businesses overcome regulatory and legislative obstacles. She has also worked to ensure veterans get the mental and medical health care they need, and that every family has the opportunity to work hard and get ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcome, welcoming Congresswoman Kirsten Sinema. Thank you. Well, thank you. It is so good to be here with all of you this morning. And Anne, thank you so much for that kind introduction. It is great to be here with business leaders who are driving growth and generating opportunity in the Tempe community. Thank you so much, Chris, and for the Maricopa Community College team for hosting us today and for the incredibly important work that you do every day to ensure that Arizonans have the skills and tools they need to get ahead. And I appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy schedules to be with me this morning and, and have some time to talk, because your work is helping lead the way for business growth across the state. You know, my job is to listen and learn from all of you, to figure out what's working, what's not working, and how we can work together to expand opportunity for all Arizonans. So this is my fifth State of the District address, and it is really an honor to be back with you again this year. The Tempe business community is a dedicated partner in the work that we're doing to make Arizona the very best place to live, work, and to grow a business. And every time we get together and talk, I hear the same message loud and clear. To continue to thrive, we have got to put politics aside and work together on real solutions to our challenges. And that's how you all work in your businesses every day. 
And it's the same approach that I take in representing Arizonans in Congress. We're ready and willing to do anything it takes to get things done. And that makes us a good team. Over the past five years, we've had some important successes. A few years ago, I heard from local business owners that the health insurance tax was going to dramatically increase the cost of providing health insurance for their employees. And I knew we had to do something to fix it. So I've led the work to repeal this costly, burdensome tax, and I'm proud to say we've once again successfully delayed the tax from implementation. This is a big win in our work to help businesses succeed and ensure that employees have access to quality, affordable health insurance. But our work is not over, so I'll keep working on both sides of the aisle until we get a full repeal. Similarly, when we heard that the medical device tax would harm local job growth, reduce access to capital, and slow research and development in Arizona, we stood up for common sense. And earlier this year, we delayed the tax for another two years. We've also reauthorized the Export-Import Bank to help Arizona companies compete on a level playing field abroad. And we passed our Senior Safe Act to combat senior financial abuse. Our bill has passed the House and the Senate and should be signed into law within the next few weeks. We've reduced and simplified regulations to help small businesses and entrepreneurs grow and hire in Arizona. I'm proud that our approach has delivered real results for Arizona families and businesses. We've accomplished a lot, but we're nowhere near done. Because Washington is reaching a level of chaos and dysfunction even I didn't think was possible. Mm -hmm. We're three months into 2018, and congressional leaders have already shut the government down. Twice. So we had an opportunity to secure our borders and allow dreamers to stay here in this country, the only country they've ever known. And the overwhelming majority of Arizonans and Americans supported this fix, but unfortunately, leaders in Congress let this opportunity slip right through their fingers. And we saw that Washington dysfunction was at its peak during the past year debate over health reform. You'd think that an issue as important as health care, an issue that touches every family and makes up an especially large part of Arizona's economy, ought to be an area where we can work together to make progress. But hardworking families shouldn't have to choose between putting food on the table and paying for health insurance. But unfortunately, some politicians in Washington are more interested in scoring political points than passing real solutions, all while health care is still out of reach for too many Arizona businesses and families. So just recently, Congress left town once again without making fixes to our health care system, and that was a mistake. Because businesses in Arizona need relief, and it's Congress's job to deliver those solutions. Everywhere I go, people tell me that they're frustrated with Washington. And when I talk to Arizonans, they tell me they're fed up with the chaos and the infighting. You know, they're thinking about putting gas in their car and sending their kids to college. And they're worried that, really for the first time ever, that their kids won't have a better life than the life that they've had. So while they're trying to pay bills and take care of their kids, they see a bunch of politicians in Washington just fighting each other instead of getting things done. No wonder they're fed up. Because those in Washington just don't seem to get what it's like for the rest of us in the country. So many of the struggles that everyday Arizonans face are personal to me because I've lived them too. Many of you know I went through tough times growing up. My family struggled to make ends meet and for a while we were homeless. So I know what it's like to go without a meal and not have health insurance. I mean, heck, we didn't have running water for a long time. But when my stepdad got a job, our family made it out of poverty. And I went to college because I knew that a good education would ensure that I had access to a good job. And just like in my life, the chance to make a better life for everyday Arizonans all comes down to good paying jobs. And that's why we need leaders who are focused on getting the job done, not on scoring political points for one party or for the other. Every year, I get named one of the most independent members of Congress. That's probably no surprise to all of you in this room, because everybody knows that I'll work with anyone, literally anyone, to get things done. And these days, I'm working on pragmatic, realistic actions that we can take to spur economic growth that leads to good paying jobs in Arizona. First, we're working on outdated regulations that keep Arizona small businesses from growing and hiring more workers. So we're cutting red tape and we're bringing Washington up to the speed of Arizona small businesses. Second, 
Arizona entrepreneurs, startups, and technology companies face too many obstacles before they can bring their cutting edge products to the market. So we're inspiring Arizona innovation and helping create good paying tech jobs across the state. And third, we've got to ensure that every Arizonan has the skills needed to compete in today's global economy. So we're working to prepare our kids and our current workers with the tools to become a 21st century workforce. Small businesses across our state want to expand. They want to create jobs and bring their products and services into new communities. But too often, these companies are held back by old, tired Washington regulations. First International Bank, right here in Scottsdale, told me that they struggle to meet and manage these outdated regulations. This community bank is a valuable partner for local small businesses and they provide critical access to capital. The needs of small businesses have changed dramatically in the last 23 years since First International has been in Scottsdale. But our regulatory system has not kept pace. The bank's president here in Arizona, Greg Miskowski, he told me that many regulations are well-intentioned, but that they stifle our ability to make loans to small businesses seeking to expand and hire new workers. So I knew we needed to strike a balance so that banks like Greg's can continue to support small businesses. So my bill, the Comprehensive Regulatory Review Act, finds that balance and has Greg's support. So our bill requires federal agencies to evaluate financial regulations and make sure that they work for modern companies. Based on this review, agencies will have to update their rules to fit today's business and consumer environment, which will cut red tape and free up capital in communities like Scottsdale and Tempe. So we passed that bill through the House of Representatives last month, and now we're working on the Senate. And I'll keep working until we get that bill to the President's desk. Supporting small businesses also means creating an environment that inspires Arizona innovation. We know that Arizona is a great place to turn an idea into a successful business. Arizonans with fresh, out-of-the-box ideas are making our state a top destination for cutting-edge innovation and investment. So our bill, the HALOS Act, supports angel investors who find and fund promising startups. Our bill makes it easier for investor groups to sponsor demo days, where startups can share their ideas with businesses, academic, and investment communities. These early networking opportunities are critical for startups to get their feedback on business ideas and to meet potential future investors. We passed the HALOS Act through the House recently, and we're working to get it through the Senate. Our state is home to amazing companies at the cutting edge of their technologies. One of these companies is Tucson's HTG Diagnostics. HTG has pioneered technology that performs gene testing in as little as 24 hours. HTG's technology enables doctors to quickly and accurately determine the best treatment for patients who are grappling with unexplainable symptoms or illnesses. Washington should be tearing down roadblocks so that HTG can bring its life-saving breakthroughs to every lab in the country. But instead, there are arbitrary rules that hold back this company and holding back other emerging biotech companies with expensive and unnecessary audits. So I introduced the Fostering Innovation Act. It's bipartisan legislation to allow emerging growth companies to invest their dollars into research and development instead of unnecessary audits so they can get their products to market. We passed this bill through the House and we're working to get it through the Senate. Arizonans are hardworking and resourceful, but to stay competitive in today's global marketplace, we must ensure that our workers develop the skills that modern companies need. From kindergarten through high school, we need to provide Arizona students with a solid foundation that prepares them for a good paying job or a college degree. In 2016, Arizona's voters set aside $3.5 billion for our state kids. And I worked with Senator John McCain to protect that money that Arizona voters directed to our schools. Working together to improve Arizona schools is common sense but Arizona has a lot of work yet to do for our kids to get the education they deserve. And I'll continue to work hard to ensure that Arizona students are prepared for success. To stay competitive in our global marketplace, many Arizonans need to build new skills right now. Startups and tech companies like HTG are looking for employees who compete in the 21st century workforce. 
So we need more apprenticeships programs and skills training to help everyday Arizonans learn while they earn and ensure that we're helping workers transition to higher paying careers. With your help, I know we can put these ideas into action and bring more good paying jobs to Arizona. Washington is certainly dysfunctional, but I'm working with good people in both parties to get stuff done every day. And I'll continue to work on these three priorities, but I wanna do more. So I'll be traveling across the state this month, listening to business leaders about the challenges and opportunities they're facing. And I wanna hear directly from you about how we can bring more jobs to our state and then work together to make those ideas a reality. Last year, shortly after the 2016 election, many of you asked me what I thought would happen in Congress. And I told you the honest truth, nobody knows. But it's been a roller coaster since then. But one thing I can say that I know for sure, the way forward has never been more clear. We desperately need leaders who will put country ahead of party, who will stop the fighting, and who will work together to find common ground. We know that real progress is only achieved when we put aside our differences and focus on solving problems. We're practical people. We understand what it means to roll up our sleeves and get to work. But politicians in Washington don't realize that the answers we need aren't based on one party being right and the other party being wrong. Frankly, Arizonans don't care if you have an R or a D next to your name, as long as you get the job done. And I'm one of the most independent members of Congress. That's helped me cut through the chaos and get the job done for Arizona businesses and families time and time again. And I'm so grateful to be able to represent all of you, and I look forward to getting even more stuff done for Tempe and for Arizona. So thank you so much for having me here today, and thank you for your work on behalf of our great state. And Anne, it looks like I have time for some questions. Yeah? Did I really answer all the questions? No, not yet. Oh, hey, Molly. Hello. Um, I'm glad you mentioned your work with Senator McCain on the congressional change to allow Prop 123 to be spent. Um, do you have any opinion? I'm going to ask you to put your legal hat on. Uh, do you have any opinion about whether Neil Wake will require the past contributions to be uh, recaptured or? you know, what that looks like for the education funding going forward. I feel confident that all the dollars that have been taken from the trust and put towards education as directed by the voters in 2016 will remain in the coffers of our education facilities. So um, Judge Wake issued a decision earlier this week and said, you know, we have to go, you know, take a look. Um, the language that Senator McCain and I worked to insert into the most recent omnibus bill is quite clear. It enables the state of Arizona to move those dollars as the voters uh, indicated was their goal and their interest. Um, and because it's a civil piece of legislation, it should apply retroactively. Um, the language is, is very simple that we inserted into the bill. Basically, it says that Congress accepts the will of the voters of Arizona and will allow you know, this provision to exist. And it, it, it's not time bound in terms of only moving forward. So I feel confident that either now at the trial court or on appeal um, that we will be able to protect all of these dollars. The voters were very clear in 2016 when they passed Prop 123. And the language that we worked to put into this, um, into the most recent omnibus bill simply says that Congress honors the will of the voters. And so, I, I think it's pretty cut and dry. Thanks. There's a mic coming right behind you. I was just going to yell. <laughs> That'd work too. Uh, good morning. I was just wondering, you were talking about uh, eliminating regulations, and as we move forward with technology and pharmaceuticals and so forth, is there any way the government can create some type of law regulation that protects all the companies that are moving forward, the biotech and everything else, because there's going to be 
something somewhere down the line that's going to cause somebody to have a small toe fall off in 20 years and you're going to see loss, you know, the late night TV, sue for this, sue for that, or a cell phone battery is going to do something where I would think the people who are trying to create the products for tomorrow are going to constantly be sued. Is there something that can slow that part down? Because obviously if there's going to be all these extra lawsuits and class action things, that's going to cost, you know, people a lot of money down the line. Is there something that can be common sense today that will help prevent that tomorrow? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a good question. It's not some it's not an element of this level of innovation that Congress has spent a lot of time thinking about. An area that's similar that we have spent some time addressing is around patent litigation and patent protection. Um, there are this, there's this phenomenon in America where patent trolls basically swoop in and like kind of steal stuff from people who've made these incredible innovations um, around biotech and emerging growth. Um, and we were, we were moving forward with some of this legislation in Congress and unfortunately it got stymied by, this is surprising, partisanship. Um, and so um, we've tried three times to move forward some legislation around the issue of unnecessary and frivolous litigation. And unfortunately, each of the three times we've tried to move forward, the bill has been stymied by partisanship. It's my hope that uh, we can try again next year. Um, the Judiciary Committee is the committee of jurisdiction over this issue. Um, the current chair, Congressman Goodlatte, is retiring. Um, and so I think the, the new chair, whoever he or she might be, might be willing to take a set of fresh eyes to address this issue and to have us try and take a look at it again. Um, but I, I don't expect anything to, to happen this year on that issue. Yes. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the um, Office of National Drug Control Policy being dismantled. We're funded a uh, Tempe coalition um, to reduce underage drinking and substance use um, through drug-free communities. And we're worried about that funding going to the Health and Human Services along with HIDA going to Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, this is a, a decision that's made by the administrative branch. So Congress doesn't have a lot of um, oversight in this area, but um, a number of us bipartisan um, groups of, of members of Congress and senators have expressed our concern about the elimination of that department, um, particularly in places like Arizona, um, where we have, you all I'm sure know this, we have the strictest DUI laws in the country. So making sure that we're educating particularly young people about the dangers of alcohol abuse and the dangers of drinking and driving, I think is really particularly important in our state. So I am concerned about that. I would certainly encourage you to reach out to the administration and voice your concerns, which I I'm guessing you probably already have. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, there's a bill that's currently making its way through Congress that made news in the last couple of weeks uh, on Dodd-Frank rollback, where they're attempting to reduce some of the, the more burdensome regulations, but at the same time, they're granting more power to credit bureaus like Equifax that have not historically been good custodians of personal information. Uh, I would like to know where you stand on the Dodd-Frank rollback and that particular bill uh, and what, what your feelings are on it. Well, I'm not sure exactly what bill you're referring to, but what I can tell you is the work that we're doing on Equifax. I serve on the Financial Services Committee, um, and so obviously the Equifax breach, which turns out is even worse than we were told when we first learned about the significant breach. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Equifax breach was the, one of the largest breaches of personal data in America's history. And even though it's this huge, massive breach, it's only one of five massive breaches that have occurred in, occurred in the last year. So the breaches are becoming more common and incredibly significant. So I've been working with um, my colleagues in, in the committee to um, try to use subpoena power to bring Equifax to the committee to testify um, and have asked the chairman to bring Equifax back in so we can ask these tough questions. One of the reasons I'm pushing the chairman to do this um, and asking him to, to bring Equifax back in so that we can hold Equifax accountable is that the agency that is um, charged with doing this, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, isn't doing it. So the Consumer Finan Financial Protection Bureau, which is an agency created under Dodd-Frank, independent agency that reports directly to the administration, um, their job is 
to hold Equifax accountable um, and bring them in for um, meetings and make them produce documents and ensure that we're getting this transparency and accountability. And the CFPB has, has not done that. Um, so we've also reached out to the CFPB um, and have said, please do your job. Um, and right, and continue to um, ask the chairman to hold Equifax more accountable. Most recently, um, in each of my hearings that I participate at in the Financial Services Committee, I have been continuing to address the issue of Equifax and the data breaches and the negative impact they've had on Arizonans. Um, uh, in, in response to your question about legislation, I'm not sure which bill you're talking about because there are lots and lots of bills that we've been working on, some of which do have an impact on Dodd-Frank. Um, what I can say is that we are working in a bipartisan way in both the House and Senate to pass reasonable changes to some elements of Dodd-Frank that have been overburdensome. For instance, regulating insurance the same way that you regulate banks doesn't make sense. They, they have totally different systems in terms of how they operate and their risk levels are completely different. And similarly, regulating a, a community bank in the way that you regulate one of the big four makes no sense because community banks don't engage in risky behavior. They don't have the same level of capital. Um, that allows them to float in a way that larger banks do. And so these are areas that I've been working on over the last five and a half years in Congress. And I'd be happy to follow up with you later to find out which specific piece of legislation you're concerned about. Um, one thing I will point out is that the, the Senate recently passed a package um, uh, which, in, which included a variety of um, issues in the financial services industry. And while that package hasn't yet come to the House for a final vote, I am excited about this Senate package because eight of the pieces of legislation that I've introduced and passed through the House are included in this package in the Senate. That's a lot. It's very exciting. Um, and these are all individual pieces of legislation, some of which I spoke about in my comments today and some of which I didn't have time to address, that just kind of get rid of some of this red tape and bureaucracy for Arizona small businesses and help them get that shot to get ahead and, and grow their businesses. Yes? Um, oh, thank you, Chris. Um, it seems like every computer can be hacked. I mean, it seems like nothing is safe. Is the utility grid and the financial grid at serious risk? I do think that there are very serious risks too. Uh, and I, I think it's smart that you pointed out utilities. This is something that most Americans have not paid a lot of attention to. But um, I, I think it's incumbent on local governments and companies that engage in public-private partnerships to um, hire folks who are cyber experts to increase cybersecurity. I actually lead a task force. Um, it's a caucus. A caucus is just a collective group of people who share the same interest in Congress. And I'm the um, Democratic chair of the FinTech Caucus, which is Financial Technology Caucus. A big part of what we're doing is cybersecurity. So I've been kind of raising the flag for years to say, we don't have the kind of cyber protection we need, not just in our financial institutions, but in our local government municipal municipal um, institutions, so our water systems, our utility systems, um, even our waste treatment systems, we really need to invest in the hiring the best and the brightest cyber minds in our country to help us protect those institutions. Part of the challenge that we face is there aren't a lot of people trained and educated to do that work. And those who are mostly work for the NSA. So um, about four and, a, four and a half years ago, um, I sat down with a group of small bank owners, actually, who then started talking to me about their concerns around cybersecurity. We ended up working with UAT, which is a private technology university in the East Valley, with MCC and with ASU. And within the space of four months, Michael Crow had developed and approved a new degree specifically training students in cybersecurity. So now we have, in addition to certificates at our local levels, we also have an actual degree that you can get at ASU um, that allows you to become a talented and skilled professional in the world of cybersecurity so that the private community can hire the same kind of talent that our federal system enjoys today. But the work we have to do to catch up 
um, to hire more white hats to fight against the black hats is very, very significant. And my recommendation, of course, is for any business or municipality um, to, to reach out to, to your local community college and reach out to ASU, reach out to UAT, and look for those bright students who are learning the tools of cybersecurity. Get them on your teams because, um, frankly, there aren't very many people who know how to do this work, and we need more. And it's, I'm done. Anne's coming up. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, she was awarded again just a few weeks ago for 2018, the Spirit of Enterprise Award. So congratulations on that. And here with us today is Vartan Jahanian, and he's the Western Region Manager for the U.S. Chamber to recognize her with that award. So please welcome Vartan. Thanks, Anne, and thanks to your entire team here at the Tempe Chamber for all the work that you do fighting on behalf of the small businesses in Tempe, so we really appreciate that. As Ma Anne mentioned, my name is Vartan. I'm the Western Region Manager for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The U.S. Chamber is the world's largest business federation. We represent three million businesses around the world, most of which are small firms under 10 employees. Despite all the chaos in Washington, 2017 was a pretty good year for biz the business community in D.C. Uh, we had a lot of great achievements, whether it was tax reform, regulatory reform, and um, a, we got a great new addition to the Supreme Court, Justice Gorsuch. Um, and we'd like to give credit where credit is due. Congress, of course, had a huge part in some of those successes. And so for the last 30 years, the U.S. Chamber has been awarding what we call the Spirit of Enterprise Award. This award is presented to members of Congress based on their key votes on critical business legislation. Last year, in the first session of the 115th Congress, we looked at a total of 14 different votes on on issues ranging anywhere from the HALOS Act to tax reform to a number of other issues. And from those 14 votes, the members of Congress who scored at least 70% were eligible to receive that award. And I'm very happy to say that Congresswoman Cinema is one of only 13 Democrats who received this award last year out of almost 300 who got the award. So we're very, very grateful uh, for that. Not only has she been uh, great with the those 14 issues that we discussed, but her leadership on providing oversight for the CFPB and the work that um, she's also done on the health insurance tax has been phenomenal. So we're very grateful for that. And with that, I'd like to present Congresswoman Cinema with the Spirit of Enterprise Award. Some more photos. It's not awkward. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations and thank you, Congresswoman Cinema. We appreciate all that you do and we look forward to working with you to continue to make Arizona a great place for business and innovation. So congratulations. Let's give her another round of applause. Before we conclude today, I just want to again thank our sponsors, uh, Rio Salado College and the Maricopa County Community College District, APS and Southwest Gas, Dignity Health, SRP, and State Farm Insurance. Um, as you all walked in, there was an opportunity to buy some raffle tickets for some tic uh, airline passes as well as some sporting events. So we're going to draw those really quickly. So take out all those red tickets. Really, really been, they've been stirring this for the last half hour. And the Congresswoman has a very busy schedule, so we thank you for your time. So who wants to take me on vacation with our Southwest Airlines e-passes? All right. And if I can read it, 334972. Three, three, 334972. Three, Peter! <laughs> Congratulations. We've got your passes up here. Come on up. 
All right, the next are the tickets and the parking pass to the Suns versus Pelicans game. Pelicans. And it's 335-942. Oh, Dawn, who said earlier I never win anything. <laughs> and then the last one for Mother's Day, the Diamondbacks versus the Nationals. Oh, no. Three three four zero nine two. Oh, Molly. <laughs> all right, thank you. Congratulations to all the winners and thank you to the donors. And finally, thank you all for being here today and supporting the Tempe Chamber of Commerce. Enjoy the rest of your day and your holiday Easter weekend. Thank you.